In the late 20th century, especially in the 1960s and 1970s, barriers were broken down for civil rights and women's rights. Today, we're going to talk about one of the most powerful women in the United States during that time. Hi, I'm Library Lynn, and I make knowing about great nonfiction books my mission. Don't know what to read next? I always have ideas. Just to be clear, I do tend to be a backlist reader with an occasional newish book thrown in. Today, we're going to talk about Personal History by Katherine Graham. We'll cover the three main things I liked from the book, and I'll tell you what I liked most and what I liked least about it. And stay tuned to the end for the number one life lesson I got from the book. Katherine Graham never sought fame or power, but she was the daughter of a very wealthy man named Eugene Isaac Meyer, who lived in New York City and was a very successful businessman in the early years of the 20th century. Catherine, or Kay, as her family called her, was the fourth of five children. Um, she had two older sisters, one older brother, and a younger sister. Her father was um, a very busy man, and he was awkward with his children and didn't spend much time with them. And her mother really never wanted to be a mother. She wanted to be an intellectual. So for the most part, Kay and her siblings were raised by nannies and governesses, but that was pretty common at that time for that social class. But Graham, through no striving of her own, found herself at the helm of the Washington Post after her husband, Phil Graham, died in 1963. She spent nearly three decades running the Post when her son, Bill, took over in the early 1990s. In her years there, she also ran Newsweek magazine. For a woman to be at the helm of any company at that time was unusual, but the influence of her publishing company made her influence somewhat unprecedented. At the time, many people underestimated her abilities because of her sex, and to some extent, she did herself as well. But Graham, despite her own worries, steered the paper and the magazine through strikes, several presidencies, not to mention the Watergate scandal, where two of her reporters, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, broke the story. All that was fascinating enough, but in this 625-page memoir, it's a chunk, um, that was packed with facts, circumstances, and her memories, she manages to get across an astounding amount of information about what it was like to be at the seat of power during so many turning points in history. There are so many stories here, I can't possibly touch on them all. But as usual, I'm going to talk about the three main things I learned from the book. Number one, you don't have to be wealthy to become influential and powerful, but it sure does help. And having wealth doesn't make things easy for you. At least it didn't for her. Her father bought the Washington Post in 1933 when she was finishing up high school, and she didn't even know he bought it for a couple of years after he did. After graduating from high school, Kay attended Vassar for two years and decided she wanted more of an intellectual challenge, so she transferred to the University of Chicago for her last two years in school. After that, she took a job with a newspaper in California, and then after about a year there, she moved back to Washington and worked at the Post for her father. She was in her early 20s, young and carefree, and that's where she met her husband, Phil. They hung around with the same group of people while they were young in Washington. Phil was from a poorer family in Florida. His mother was a school teacher, and his father was a struggling farmer, but Phil was brilliant, and her father made him the head of the Washington Post before he died. So while Phil ran the paper, Kay ran the house, raised her children and entertained friends um, and watched her husband become more and more influential in Washington. It was only his mental illness and tragic death that catapulted Kay to the head of the organization. None of this is to say that Kay didn't deserve her position. Um, she had worked on the paper and followed it closely and she genuinely cared about it. There's no doubt that she and her husband did a good job at the Post, but without Kay's father's wealth and privilege, it's unlikely either would have been in a position to take it over. But as we sometimes say, maybe it was just meant to be. The second thing I learned from the book, the press and the halls of power tend to walk hand in hand. As far as politics go, Kay's parents, mother and father, were staunch conservatives. 
And Kay and Phil were brought up in a different time. They came of age during the Great Depression and um, they, they married right before we got involved in World War II. So they had a different viewpoint and they tended to be pretty liberal. But as time went on, Kay became uncomfortable with the relationships Phil, her husband, was developing with powerful figures of the time like Dwight D. Eisenhower and JFK. She spent a great deal of time talking about her father's ideals for the paper. In one address on March 5, 1935, he spoke about the principles that he insisted on from the beginning, outlining them as follows. Number one, that the first mission of the newspaper is to tell the truth as nearly as the truth may be ascertained. Number two, that the paper shall tell all the truth so far as it can learn it concerning the important affairs of America and the world. Number three, that as a disseminator of the news, the paper shall observe the decencies that are obligatory upon a private gentleman. Number four, that what it prints shall be fit reading for the young as well as for the old. Number five, that the newspaper's duty is to its readers and to the public at large and not to the private interests of its owner. Number six, that in the pursuit of truth, the newspaper shall be prepared to make sacrifices of its material fortunes, if such course be necessary for the public good. Number seven, that the newspaper shall not be the ally of any special interest but shall be fair and free and wholesome in its outlook on public affairs and public men. These principles were at the heart and soul of his convictions, but how to translate them into action was the challenge. Her husband too was an idealistic young man when they met, but experience on the paper led him to become more conservative with time. Uh, Kay, and, Kay insists that she and her husband had no real difficulties over this. They just accepted and understood one another for where they were at. But it was also, politics was a problem at the newspaper, as you can imagine, amongst the people who worked for the paper. And later, after she was in charge, Kay found that she had to socialize with leaders if she wanted the paper to have inside scoops and if she wanted it to truly compete with the cutthroat competition it had in DC. The third thing I got from the book, the people who lead us are people just like we are. They're no better or worse than the rest of us. The Grahams were idealistic and deeply in love when they married, but Phil had bipolar disorder and it wrecked complete havoc on their lives. After his death, Catherine felt she had to run the post, and first she became president of the organization in 1963, and she later became the publisher in 1969. For more than 20 years after her marriage in 1940, she had been the wife of a powerful man. She hadn't run a business or worked steadily for one since. It was a bewildering world for her at the start, and here's what she had to say about that. When I first went to work, I was still handicapped with the old assumptions and was operating as though they were written in stone. When I started my job, I was inferior to the men with whom I was working. I had no business experience, no management experience, and little knowledge of the governmental, economic, political, and other matters with which we dealt. I truly felt like Samuel Johnson's description of a woman minister, quote, a woman preaching is like a dog's walking on his hinder legs. It is not well done, but you are surprised to find it done at all." Unquote. Since I regarded myself as inferior, I failed to distinguish between, on the one hand, male condescension because I was a woman, and, on the other hand, a valid view that the only reason I had my job was the good luck of my birth and the bad luck of my husband's death, but she was willing to learn. By the time she retired, the company was rated one of the top five well-managed companies in the United States. If you're curious about how she learned to do this, read the book. What I liked best about the book, I enjoyed learning what Graham really thought about people like JFK, Lyndon Johnson, Nixon, Henry Kissinger, Truman Capote, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, and Warren Buffett. Seeing all these rich and powerful people in social situations, she has lots of juicy stories to tell, and she tells them. She didn't hold back on what she saw as misogyny from JFK, stubbornness from Lyndon Johnson, and she comments freely about the presidents that followed. She liked some of them, and she detested others.
You can imagine after the Watergate scandal that she and Nixon were not on friendly terms, but the fact is they never liked each other. But the people she really liked and those she really didn't often took me by surprise. Kay Graham was a people person and it showed, and I think I would have liked to have been friends with her. What I liked least about the book. Well, her love of people was also really one of the things I liked least about the book because she spent so much time talking about people that were friends of hers for short periods of time or through the years. I tended to get confused because she would mention somebody early in the book and then not mention them until much later. I had forgotten who they were if they weren't already famous. So it was sometimes it was a little bit of a people overload for me. I think that's um, actually a charming part of the book as well. I mean, I, it just really showed how much she cared about people. And the final lesson I got from the book, Graham stepped down from leading the paper in 1993 when her son Bill took over. She was about 80 years old at the time. And even though she wasn't in charge, she stayed busy. But the adjustment from being the center of activity to the periphery really was hard for her. So I'm going to read you what she says at the end of the book about using this memoir to come to grips with the past while she was growing older. Worry, if not gone altogether, no longer haunts you in the middle of the night, and you are free, or freer, to turn down the things that bore you and spend time on matters with people you enjoy. I am grateful to be able to go on working and to like my new life so well that I don't miss the old one. It's dangerous when you are older to start living in the past. Now that it's out of my system, I intend to live in the present, looking forward to the future. I didn't agree with everything she did, but I admired her immensely. Here's my takeaway. No matter what life throws at you, it's always possible to meet it head on. And that's heroic. All it takes is a willingness to face each challenge, to do your best at the time. And it helps to have the humility to seek out help from others, but you also need to have the backbone to stand up and do what you think is right, even when others disagree. So that's my review of Personal History by Katherine Graham. Do you agree or disagree with my points? Did I leave something out? Do you have another book on women's history that you would like to recommend? If so, leave a comment below. For more worthwhile nonfiction books to read, hit like and subscribe so you will always have fresh ideas. And if you would like great books at your fingertips, check out my book, Library Lens Curated Collection of Superlative Nonfiction. I gathered together 65 lists worth of recommended books going back a century and arranged them in Dewey Decimal order, just like in a public library. You will find links to personal history and my book in the description box below. If you use my link, I'll get a small commission, which I would really appreciate. And finally, share this video with your book-loving family and friends. Until next time, happy reading.